our mighty forces decimated, our great citadel razed, our bountiful plains scorched, our wondrous mountains shattered. The plague of war and conquest has broken our people and sent them scampering amongst the stars in search of refuge. Defeated but not vanquished, we scour the galaxy for a safe haven. Refugees in our own supercluster, we lie patiently adrift within our colossal vessels. Expeditions are launched in hopes of gaining a new home and foothold from which to mount our resistance and vie to reclaim what is ours. Many of these gallant martyrs are to never be seen again, and those that do, return without bounty. A century passes, and we continue to endure in this cruel purgatory. A whole generation of children know only of their verdant realm and glorious heritage through the stories and memories of their elders. They know not the fragrant forests in spring, the shimmering spray of our ocean, or the glorious din of battle, only the cold indifference of space. It is for them that we press forth. As the decades wane on, our desperation fastens and we are driven to search darker, wilder regions of space. Sectors shrouded in myth and mystery, where primordial forces are said to emanate and manifest. The first seeds of creation were avowedly sown here, from whence spawned forth deities raw and unfathomable. The scryers and sages hearken so. But we have not the time nor patience for such fable, and so we probe further and further into this ominous domain. One day, a rumour begins to cascade through the vessels. Hope colours our spirits once again. A planet has been found suitable in climate, size and resources. For the first time in 111 years, the drive of our capital vessels clamour into roaring life and tear for us a path through the fabric of space to our new but temporary home. Carvortis becomes the name of this provisional world in honour of our glorious leader, Queen Vortix, who so valiantly fended off our invaders in her gleaming mech plate and salvaged our civilization from the cradle of utter obliteration. For the first time in an age, our people feel the caress of grass under their feet and wind through their hair. Gradually, settlements are laid and our people adjust to the new conditions of this planet, the longer nights, the shorter seasons, the queer quality of light that radiates from our new sun. It is not a world without beauty. Immense mountain ranges and vast deep oceans cover much of the surface. And to the north, dense, dark rainforests, concealing strange ruins and megaliths from civilizations lost to time and memory. As our former glory is reconsolidated, it is decreed by Queen Vortex that a grand citadel should be founded, a great tower and fortress, the tallest and most magnificent the galaxy had ever borne witness to a testament to the resolve of our people and their scientific and military acumen, a new beacon of hope and strength, the heart of our new empire. Its foundations are to delve beyond the crust of the earth and draw power from the planet's very mantle. The pinnacle is to pierce the upper layers of the stratosphere. Our drones begin to lay its first foundations, faxing minerals from our mines and printing each keystone and power line inch by inch. Entire regions are eviscerated for their ore. Such is the scale of our designs. A year's progress goes by and already the tower dwarfs the structures of our old cities. Its grandeur is soon to elevate us to majesty once again. But on the night of the first Ophelion, catastrophe strikes. A strange and powerful storm breaks loose beneath the ground and the earth is split asunder, shattering our progress beyond salvage. Where the tower once stood, there lies now a vast smouldering crater many miles in width and depth at the bottom of which spews forth magma from beneath the planet's surface and the scorching ruins of our project. Bewildered, but not disheartened, our queen commands that another tower be built in its stead, 
determined to procure a monument from which to inspire wonder in the hearts of our people and fear into that of our enemy. A second site is chosen, the area surveyed, the materials gathered, the foundations relayed. But it is not so, for once again, on the anniversary of the first tower's destruction, the second suffers the very same fate. The earth is breached by a most powerful and unseen force, and where the beginnings of our spire once stood, there now lies an immense gaping chasm into which one can glimpse the very bowels of the earth. We are all profoundly astonished, every one of us. No theory or conjecture can be made. Thus, in their desperation, our leaders turn to superstition as people do in times of harsh uncertainty. The order of scryers gather in their vast black domes to deliberate while the world lies patiently in wait. Finally, word comes forth of their controversial resolution, sending murmurs of hushed apprehension rippling through the populace. For the first time in an eon and with grave reluctance, the conscious anomaly known as the Great Voidwalker is to be consulted. It is a most powerful being of unknown origin, existing beyond the limits of our mortal perception and at the very edge of what can be considered natural. It is both of this world and yet separate from it, a consciousness said to be able to glimpse beyond the confines of the infinite wave function and convey impressions of timelines both certain and indefinite. Once worshipped by the baseborn as a god incarnate, it is both revered and feared by our culture for its capacity to defy our understanding of reality. Deriving truth and meaning from its crux, it requires mastery not practiced for millennia. Upon the initiation of the ritual, one must reach the astral plane on which it manifests and bind their mind with that of the Voidwalker. Many a scryer, magi, sage and oracle step forth to attempt this most unthinkable and archaic liturgy. One by one, we watch in horror as their minds and bodies are obliterated and debased under the pressure of the walker's vast essence, giving way to abhorrent and unnatural corruptions of form. Even Ermed, arch magi of the Order of Truth and Fire, cannot sustain the power of the Void Walker's magnitude, engulfing herself in roaring purple flame rather than letting her mind and body succumb to the execrable omnipotence of this semi-extant life force. But her death is not in vain, for just as the infestations of that most heinous star begin to take root in the nucleus of her quintessence, she is able to utter but a single phrase, the Psyche Caster. Psyche Casters, the Devangeli a caste of peoples among the baseborn whose practice of astral meditation first led to discovery of the great Voidwalker and other such entities not wholly native to this universe. Valued for their skill in battle and yet shunned by our society for their worship of demon as deities, it seems to many that the Archmagi's final words were an indication of a Devangeli conspiracy to bring down the tower through their illegal magics and bring about the destruction of our empire from within. Queen Vortex commands that their elders be brought before the High Council to stand trial for high treason but they defy her order and rain down vicious flashes of white burning light upon any that would enter their mountainous colony. To heighten the matter, many of the baseborn tribes and castes take pity on the Psyche casters and side with them in their struggle, splitting our society in twain and posing for the first time in three centuries the threat of civil war. In a galaxy strewn with adversaries bent on our demise, it seems that we ourselves should be the one to bring about our undoing. Amidst the rising tensions, another unprecedented and extraordinary occurrence unfolds. A young girl appears before the steps of the royal palace and proceeds to stride directly into the throne room to address Queen Vortex herself. No guard, barrier, wall or weapon can stop her. For by some arcane art she merely passes through them, 
She is of an ilk rarely seen in this age, for her eyes burn with a most brilliant white flame, and around her there hums an aura of the same vibrancy. She is a Kambi, her father of the Devangeli, her mother of the demon. Such children are considered abominations in our culture, or otherwise feared for the supernatural power instilled within them. The palace is sent into frenzy and turmoil. Surely this half-breed has been sent to assassinate our queen in one fell swoop? As she enters the throne room, Vortex charges her proton lance and pulls down her visor, keen to meet her would-be slayer head-on. But instead, marvels as the girl bows down in a gesture of submission. Henceforth, the girl recounts that she has successfully bound her mind with that of the Void Walker, for her demon blood and sightcaster prowess did safeguard her from its overbearing enmity, and thus from the folds of its nexus was able to derive the true cause of the tower's ill fate. Near the very beginning of time, when the universe was new and crude, Two primordial beings were encased in this planet and bound to its core, locked forevermore in perpetual struggle for domination. What appeared to us to be a planet was in actual fact a celestial prison for two of time's most ancient and calamitous spirits. By piercing the planet's crust, we had unwittingly created a vent by which but an iota of the power generated by this infinite battle could burst forth and wreak havoc on our designs. And so it comes to pass that the tomes of old be brought forth from our annals for the order of scryers and devangeli druids to make a study of the ancient runes kept within. So too are the hieroglyphs etched upon the mysterious ruins of this planet gradually deciphered in order to bolster our theories. With our combined knowledge and unified ambition, a new ritual is devised and performed at the perimeter of the smouldering crater where the tower was first laid to ruin. Thus, the spell that held these two forces at bay is gradually waned until they spew forth from the fissure with a most terrible and thunderous display of light and energy. Across the globe, the violent tremors of this unfathomable eruption were felt, sending earthquakes rippling through every continent and great waves across every coast. Up, up, into the atmosphere, these two powers burst until the entire sky is ablaze with their celestial impressions beaming mists of a shimmering iridescence, both wondrous and terrifying, two vestiges of an age before time. And so, in the heavens above us the two spirits do battle. Night and day become indistinguishable as these two lustrous nebula-like energies collide. On occasion, and only for a fleeting moment, their fiery, semi-psychical forms can be defined through the flashes and blaring incandescence. One appears as a silvery, nightmarish beast with countless tentacle-like arms, the other as a kind of twirling crimson serpent, all teeth, claw and fury. For ninety days and nights the conflict rages on, and our people can only cower in awe and anxious fascination of this most fearsome display. Finally, after an intense outpouring of thunderous strikes, the silver beast is at last destroyed, scattering its remnants across the cosmos as sand into the wind. We look on as the crimson serpent writhes and dances across the night sky, as if in victory, before casting itself through space and time to bounds unknowable and vast. A calm descends upon our planet, as people try to derive meaning from the event they have just beheld, an occurrence the likes of which had until now only been related through myth and fable. The tower is rebuilt for a third and final time, 
restoring our past glory and hopes for a brighter future, whilst a new harmony amongst strata of society is forged. The Devangelia permitted to practice their magic freely once again, and their legion are elevated to serve as within the royal vanguard, while the Cambian girl Merdine is in reward for her services to the Empire, promoted as the new Archmagi, one of Queen Vortex's most trusted advisory position. Now our eyes turn once more to the home that was so cruelly snatched from us as the drums of war roar wildly into life. New, gleaming legions of mech warriors march out from our foundries and fleets of dreadnoughts from our shipyards, sleek and immense. All around the world there prevails a sense of righteous thirst for blood in the hearts of our people, a brooding, vicious tension soon to be unleashed in battle and havoc. To mark this new shift in our collective character, the image of the crimson serpent-like demon is adopted as our new banner and crest. For just as the pale beast was vanquished by the flaming spirit, so too will we banish every man, woman and child from that race of fiendish invaders down into the darkest pits of hell on a raft of screaming fire and blood. Vengeance will be ours. Narration by Mafrida Hayes, writing by George Pritchard, and sound design by Kai Gwilym Pritchard. Follow the podcast on Twitter at Chain of Being and email us at chainofbeingofficial at gmail.com for inquiries and stuff. Cover art by Kai Gwilym Pritchard. Thanks for listening. Space, the final frontier. That's it. That's as fast as she'll go. Distance of the wave. 10,000 kilometers and closing. A gigantic sphere just appeared the moment we crossed into it. And what's that glowing orb at the center? It's a star, Captain. We're inside a Dyson sphere. This is Captain Nyota Uhura calling the other starship Excelsior. These are the voyages of the... Oh, who am I kidding? Can't you see you just walked into a trap? We use an ancient gateway to explore the farthest reaches of the galaxy. Hell, all stop. Turn and fight. Too late. Gateway transition in three, two, one. To defend yourself for I shall feed. Who then? Who killed you all? The dark. Machines in the dark. Ugh. Machines in the dark. The Borg. That's the secret my unit has been guarding, Cadet. Not another invasion, but the promise of one. Our assignment is to find out what we can and come back alive. The rest is rhetoric. The thing about saber rattling is that there's no good way to stop it until somebody pulls a saber out. We need the brave. We need the brilliant. Or the Federation will fail. So, history never forgets the name. Excelsior. Or the name Chekhov. All hands, this is the captain. Two, one. Hit it. Starship Excelsior, a Star Trek fan production at StarshipExcelsior.com or anywhere good podcasts are found.